Well, remember when you were a kid, you always asked the question, how do you know? Why? You know, explain it to me more. Well, as we get older, we lose that sense of curiosity, but it's important in retirement that we do still have that. We ask those questions and we make sure we understand everything about our retirement plan. So in this episode of My Retirement Clarity, we'll do that with Lee Perkins. That's coming up next. Welcome to the My Retirement Clarity Podcast, where our goal is simple, to help you close the gap between what you know and what you implement. The team at JL Perkins Wealth Management does this by helping good people make great decisions so they can enjoy an amazing retirement. And now here's your host and financial advisor, Lee Perkins. Welcome into My Retirement Clarity. I am Ben George with Lee Perkins. He is the owner and financial advisor at JL Perkins Wealth Management in wonderful Macon, Georgia. Lee, good to catch up with you again. How are you? Man, I'm, ex- I'm doing well. I'm excited about this episode because I, I like what you, s- you said there in the intro of, of asking questions. It, it, like you said, it makes me think back to when when our kids were young and they ask a thousand questions. And, and as an advisor, one of the things that I do all day, every day is answer questions. Hmm. What about this? How do I do this? So yeah, this, this should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I was kind of curious before you jump into it. H- how I guess curious are the people that that come into your office because I think a lot of times you know people are a little overwhelmed by financial planning and and maybe just you feel like you don't want to ask a dumb question right and and seem like you're dumb so are people naturally curious and ask a lot or do you have to kind of prod them to to ask questions about different aspects of their plan yeah that's that's a great point there I I think most of the times I'm having to prod them for the to ask questions because. A lot of people have, that come into our office have never met with a financial advisor before, and so they don't really know what what we do. Right. Um, a lot of people, you know, like if I see one of my clients at Publix or somewhere else, and, and and they see me and they've got somebody, and if they introduce me as their as their stockbroker, I sort of cringe because that's the last thing that I do. So. If my clients really don't know, I mean, they know what I do, but if, if they don't know enough to, to know how to introduce me as their financial advisor, I wouldn't expect somebody that just walks in to know that I, that I do anything other than invest the money. And of course, mm-hmm. that is, that's certainly a, a big part of what we do, but yeah, that's, that's, we do a whole lot more than that for people. So yeah, sometimes I just have to uh, dig those, you know, kind of prod a little bit and, and get those questions out of them a little bit and i start and it starts with me asking them questions and then getting them to open up and and kind of explain to them what we do so yeah that's that's kind of a usually what happens in the first three to five minutes of of a meeting yeah that makes sense well a lot of times we don't know what questions to ask when we're in this situation so that's uh that's pretty common for a lot of folks so today we're gonna help you with that and try to give me some of those how do you know questions that you need to have answered before you head into retirement and of course you can always Get a personalized plan built with Lee and his team there at JL Perkins Wealth Management. Again, if you want to sit down and schedule a meeting with Lee, the easiest thing to do is go to talkwithjlp.com. You'll find a time on the calendar that works for you, and you can book that, and you'll be off and running with Lee. So, again, take advantage of that, talkwithjlp.com. All right, Lee, i got five questions here that I want to break down a little bit, and kind of have you explain how do you know when these things are uh, in place. So, First one, we, we all think this may be one you get quite a bit, but how do you know how much income you're going to need when you retire? I know this varies for everyone. So how do you figure that out? Yeah. So th- this is a really good question, Ben. And, and honestly, when I first saw this one, I was like, ah, that's, that's different because I think this is a question that's actually not asked enough because most okay. of the times people just want to zero in on how much money do I need to have saved before I can retire? I mean, I had had somebody ask me that week and that uh, l- this last week and somebody said, Hey, I've, I'm working with a buddy of mine and I told him about you. And he told me to ask you how much money he needs to have saved to retire. So that answer, it, it obviously, it depends on the question that you just asked, which is how much income you need. So how much income you need is directly related to what your expenses are. So, and, and I know to me and you, it, it seems like common sense, but a lot of times, I think people tend to overlook this. And, and to me, it, it's a simple money in and money out exercise. And a lot of people just, they just hadn't taken the time to write that down. And, and honestly, I think this is why the people don't do this is because it seems like a, a little bit like doing a budget and nobody wants to do, to do a budget. I mean, I guess you, you could make, some people could make that argument, but you know, 
it's not really putting yourself on a on a spending plan. It's just you actually identifying what you're actually spending every single month. Because a budget sounds like it sounds like punishment. Like you know you got to cut back on this or you got to cut back on that. And that's not that's not what I'm asking people to do. I just want people to identify what their expenses are, separate them by liability payments, and then what your bills are because those bills are never going away. And then we can project out to to cash flow. So, you know, once we know those things, then we're able to get into a conversation about where your income should come from. You know, it, you know, of course, if you've got guaranteed income like Social Security or, or a pension or something like that, or, or if that's not enough, maybe then we need to look at filling the gap with with the assets that you have. And then that, you know, that brings into play how much money do you have to have. So, like I've said, I've, I've said this on the show probably a hundred times, and if you're a a frequent listener to the podcast. I apologize for repeating myself, but it's very important. Your ability to retire when you want and the way you want, it's not as much based on how much money you have. It's more about how much money you spend. So that's how you answer that question. You got to know how much you spend. Yeah, I guess that's a good one to start with. You, you know, you kind of have to, that, that's an important one to figure out. Most people, I guess, to your point, aren't thinking about that aspect of it. They're probably thinking about this next one first. This probably takes priority when for the common person just thinking about retirement, but that's just how do you know how much money you should have in your savings account? So they think about the savings before they think about turning it into income. Right. All right. So so I'm going to I'm going to attack this question, not so much from a re- retirement savings, because retirement savings, again, you need to save as you know, there, there may not be a whole lot people can do with adjusting the amount of their their retirement account, you know, once once they're in their the late stages of almost retiring. I want to attack this a little bit from a from a savings account standpoint because there's not really a a one size fits all answer here. A savings account varies from dra- you know, from family to family pretty drastically. Uh, there's a bunch of things that come into play to determine how much you get, that you need f- for savings. Uh, and I would say the the number one thing would be the amount of debt that you have. If you've got a lot of debt, that means your your monthly expenses are probably pretty high. I'd also factor in how complicated your life is. Like if you've got if you've got adult children who are who are have proven themselves to be financially irresponsible, maybe you've had to bail them out before financially. Chances are you you may have to do that again, and so you might want to make sure that you've got some additional money set aside for that. If you, if you plan a trip, you want to make sure you've got additional savings set aside for that. And and this is why I always tell people, Ben, to to put to have a couple of different savings accounts. Mm-hmm. You know, generally the the financial media the, those gurus tell people, hey, you know, we we need to have six to to nine months of living expenses in an emergency fund. I think that's what right. I think that's what Dave Ramsey says, and and that that's that's good advice. Uh, certainly not a bad idea, but that may not be enough. I, I just want you to have extra money. I mean, I want you to have that money in, a, in an emergency fund, but have extra money, you know, in a different fund, a different savings account. And I usually refer to this as a trip or a stuff fund, uh, and that's for you to go and buy something that you want if you want to go take a trip. That way, you don't, you know, you don't have to pull money from your your emergency fund. You know, cruise to the to the Caribbean. That that's not an emergency, uh, but you can certainly plan for that. Uh, my wife might might hey say hey we need an emergency trip. I can't get her to go to go on a cruise, um, but I need to do that because we we've enjoyed doing that in the past. But for some reason, she's not she's not hip on cruises right now. But I, I would rather you not take that money from your really your your emergency fund. Take that from your your trip or stuff fund because if you take it from the emergency fund, then what's going to happen? Your your air conditioner is going to break down and then the transmission is going to go out on your car. Now that that completely changes your finances and things can sort of spiral, you know, downward very quickly. So yeah, I wanted to to sort of be an answer that from a from a savings account standpoint. Now, yeah. if I'm answering that from an investment account, how much or a retirement account, how much money should you have in, in a retirement account? It just depends. I mean, mm-hmm. it depends on how you know what your income need is is going to be when you retire. I've got people that will retire with a million and a half dollars or two million dollars in their their account. They're never going to spend it. Not not everybody, right. but there's some that are never going to spend it. So, technically, they could have gotten away with 
very little money in their retirement account. So again, it's a whole lot of things that come into play. So I can't give somebody just a that that one size fits all answer. Well, that's a great that was a great breakdown, Lee. Got got me thinking a little bit. How do you recommend when people are saving? Because you talk about having the emergency bucket and then having kind of the you know stuff to do bucket. Should they be putting money in those? together or should you just work on getting that savings account built up with your emergency fund set that aside then start working on the other bucket you want to save yeah i'd rather you do the the get the emergency fund uh in place first and then after that i mean if you can automate your savings that's fantastic and and ultimately if you can have money going into that trip or stuff fund every month on a consistent basis until it gets to a level that's you know, beyond something that you're going to spend on, you know, on a one-time thing, then you can take money and then go add it to, you know, an an investment account that's for longer term money. But yeah, I want you to do the emergency, I I would rather you do the emergency fund first, then fund that trip or stuff fund. And and if you don't have either, and you want to take a trip pretty soon, then maybe you put 75% in the emergency fund and 25% in the, the trip or stuff fund so that you at least see that you're you're gaining on it, you know, because I want you to have that emotional win. Because I, being finances is, it is almost a hundred percent emotional. It, right. it really is. Hey, folks, Lee Perkins here. I wanted to tell you about our brand new book called Next Phase: How to Retire in a Year or Less Without Regrets. It's all about helping you prepare for the next phase of your life, whatever that looks like for you. So if you're ready to make the most of your next phase, or if you're already retired and aren't sure you're doing all you can to get the most out of your retirement, then you'll want a copy of this book. All you have to do is text next phase to 478-475-2050 and we'll send you a copy right away. You can also access additional resources and register for one of our upcoming workshops at our website, www.myretirementclarity.com. Thanks for listening. Now back to the show. All right. Well, you kind of touched on this. I want to get to this one then next because you talked about, you know, when you, when you talk about savings compared to retirement, maybe that's a little bit of a different answer. So the next, how do you know question is how do you actually know then when you're financially ready to retire if all those numbers for everyone are different? Yeah. So th- this is a, another really good question. Ben, you got some good questions today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and th- this is one that, that my team and I are, are asked all the time. And so in my opinion, this is a pretty easy answer to determine. Uh, we use several uh, really sophisticated softwares in our office to run the numbers to determine whether or not somebody is is ready to retire financially. So, so that's the easy part. The hard part is getting somebody mentally able to retire. Now, now I'm not I'm not talking about the person that hates their job and they're going to retire the very first day they're eligible. That that's. You know, that's going to be an easy decision for them. And, and, and they, for some of those people, they might even discount their financial preparedness, you know, but, but so either way, they're going to, they're going to go out, you know, they're going to retire uh, as soon as they can. What I'm talking about is the person that knows that, that we can tell is financially ready because we've done the, the work and done the math and done the numbers, but mentally, man, they got a hard time pulling that trigger. Um, and, and truthfully, I, I think when they sometimes when people see the numbers, it, I don't think it matters what the the numbers say. That they're just scared uh, um, about the the unknown and the fear of losing that paycheck, and sometimes leads them to delay that decision for way longer than they they need to. And, and I get it. I mean, and I understand that because I've seen it play out hundreds of times. Now I've never experienced it myself because I'm still working. But you know. I, People are just really nervous once they make that decision. They start going through what I, I refer to as the emotional phases of retirement. You know, of course, a you know a, a few months prior to retirement, they're they're worried about whether or not they're making the right decision. You know, then maybe a, a month before when they turn in that paperwork, the the weight of the world's lifted off their shoulders, and they're like, "All right, now I can breathe a little bit." But then, right after they after they retire. You know, maybe they enjoy things for a month or so, and then then their mind starts to play tricks on them. Uh, they they start to wonder if they made the right decision or not. And sometimes this lasts for a couple of months, and and I'll have to do some I'll have to do some counseling with people on the phone to kind of reassure them that they've made the right decision. But usually, 
you know, I, I'd say maybe six months or so after they retire, once they, they get to a new routine and develop some new habits around retirement, they, they start to understand that they're not going to run out of money. And, and then they can begin to enjoy, you know, this, this next phase of, of, their, of their life. And, and you know, th this is actually fun to watch. I've actually, in the last couple of months, I've had two couples come in and, I, and my parents actually told me the same thing. They're, they're amazed that they've got more money in their retirement accounts than they did when they retired. Hmm. And they've been taking money out of these accounts every single month. Now, these folks have been retired for about four years, and they've got way more money and, and, than they did when they started. And like I told you, my parents said the same thing. They probably, my parents probably have twice the money that they did when they retired. Wow. And they take money out every year, hmm. RMDs and distributions. And, and they they they're finally able to relax and breathe and say, hey, we're we're, we're not going to spend all the money we have. And eventually, most people reach that realization. Now that doesn't happen to everybody because there are some people that that don't have you know they don't have the assets saved and and maybe their distribution percentage is a little bit higher. But I'm I'm guessing probably 75 percent of our our clients when they pass away are probably going to wind up with more money when they die than they did when they came aboard as clients. And that's not, it's not anything magical we've done from an investment standpoint. Uh, it's just the market working in us, us putting things in place to make sure that, that they don't make poor decisions. Um, and we, like I say, we, we want to help our clients make really good decisions. Yeah. So very important. And I know as we kind of discussed these, how do you know questions and the first ones we've hit, it does remind me about your, uh, offer for the book that you're putting out now next phase i know the next phase of your life is a difficult one to prepare for but this book's a great uh, great starting point right yeah so so that question kind of is a pretty good segue into this it's called next phase how to retire in a year or less without regrets now i think this is a great book for people who maybe are inside of a year retiring or or, or maybe if they got longer than that or even if they're already retired because it, it helps you see the idea of retirement in a different way helps you hopefully focus on what's important and lets you not worry and let you not worry about the things that that aren't as important. So yeah, short book, easy to read. If you want a copy of that, you can text next phase to 478-475-2050. And, and I just discovered maybe about two weeks ago that we we had had a, a broken link on that. So if you have texted that in the past and you did not receive anything, please do us a favor, text that and you will get a response back on your text. Click that link, add your name uh, and email address, and we'll make sure we get that out to you. Uh, we think that's fixed now, so I apologize for the for the error there. Yeah, we do appreciate everyone that has reached out. I know not only this book offer, but other ones we've had on this podcast so far and had a lot of good response from it and some good feedback, so we appreciate you taking the time to do that as well. All right, let's get a couple more how-do-you-know questions, Lee, before we get out of here today. Um, how do you know if an advisor is a good fit for you or not? Yeah, so this this is another good one because I would tell you that, like I said earlier, maybe in the first one, people are confused about what advisors really do. And, and there's right now there's a lot of noise out there about the term fiduciary. And, and I'm asked yeah. pretty frequently if I'm a fiduciary. Um, and I think people just sort of throw that term around lots of times. They don't really know what it, what it means, but they know they need to be working with a, a fiduciary. Mm -hmm. um, companies nowadays that have never served in this company capacity are now touting uh, that they're they are fiduciary. Are they really? I, I don't know. I mean, we'll let the, the regulators determine whether or not they can use that term in a, in a legal manner. So let me answer that question and then I'll define the term. Yes, I'm a fiduciary advisor. I have to act in a fiduciary capacity for my clients, which means it means I have a legally binding obligation to do what's in the best interests of my clients or I can lose my license. So when I first got into this business, I worked for Smith Barney. So of course that's, it's not here anymore. It's now Morgan Stanley. Uh, so that was a, a brokerage firm, you know, a large national wirehouse. We were not held to a fiduciary standard. We were held to a suitability standard and it, it is truly a completely different thing. So a, a broker can, can sell you something or put you in an investment that might be suitable for you but that doesn't mean that it's in your best interest uh, because, you know, some, a 60-year-old, maybe something could be suitable for, for two 60-year-olds, but their situations are completely different. So 
anyway, that, that's, that's what a suitability standard is. Lots of times on the, on the podcast, you know, I, I, I talk about the, the Fisher investment commercials uh, where they talk about, so they're now touting that they're a fiduciary. So that's, that's in all of their commercials now. But they talk about how their fees are structured so that we do better when our clients do better. And that, that sounds really cool. It sounds like something that might be unique to them. It, like I've said before, it's, it's genius marketing, but it's the same fee structure that every, every other fee-based advisory firm has. So if I'm charging you a percentage on your million-dollar account, I will certainly make more when that account grows to a million and a half or two million or whatever. So I will do better when you do better. But, you know, again, that, that's a little bit about the, the fee conversation. And, and again, if you're, if you're working with somebody who's a non-fiduciary advisor, they may sell you funds that, that they are paid a commission on, or maybe there's some type of, of selling agreement that you don't know about. So we don't participate in, in any of that. So that's maybe, I may have gone down a rabbit hole with the fee there, but regardless of what you pay, the number one thing that you need to do is to make sure that you're getting the value for what you're paying for with whoever you're meeting with. So if your advisor is, if they're only helping you with your investments, if, that, if that's all he or she does, and they never help you with anything else, like your, you know, income planning in retirement, or how to draw assets from which account at the right time, when to to pull Social Security, how to minimize your your lifetime tax burden, all those things, and and maybe even navigating the financial consequences of getting old. I'm not, I'm not sure you're getting your money's worth. Somebody came into my office. It's as we record this. What is it? August about the seventh. August the nineteenth. Yeah. Somebody came into my office a few um, a few weeks ago, and they're they're with another advisor, and that advisor only handles the investments. And so, so I asked the question: At what point? I thought this was a pretty good question that that I, I didn't come up with. I heard this from somebody. I said, so at what point did you determine that it was okay to pay full price for partial advice? And they were like, hmm, I never really thought about it that way. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was a, that was a, I thought it was a pretty good question. And, the, and they didn't really have an answer for that. And guess what? They're in our onboarding process right now to become a client. Love that. Because they know, they know we're going to do more than just the investments for them. Yeah. Love that. All right. One last question. How do you know? And a big one. I know taxes are so important to you, Leah. Tax planning is just one slice of that retirement planning uh, puzzle that you got to put together. But how do you know if your retirement plan is actually tax efficient? Man, I hate taxes. And if anybody's <laughs> listened to the show, they, they know that that's how I feel. So I, I would tell you probably 90% of the people out there don't have a clue if they have a, a tax efficient plan or not, uh, or, or if they have any kind of tax planning in place proactively going forward. Again, we use a variety of different planning tools to try to develop the most tax efficient income plan that we that we can put together. Um, the problem with, with a tax plan in general is that most people hate taxes so much they, they tend to ignore the problem and just kick this can down the road, hope it goes away, um, hope, hope things will be better in the future. But we all know that taxes are going to have to increase. And, and I, I certainly don't have to go into all the reasons because everybody, I think everybody's pretty much in the same, on the same page here. If I do a workshop and I ask for a, a hand raise, hey, what's... Do you think taxes are going up or going down? Everybody in the room raises their hand. They're going up, but but what are people doing about it? If if twenty people in the room raise their hand, it might be one or two people that are willing to make the sacrifice to put some some tax planning in place. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of people are under the impression that there's not really anything they can do about it, but that is a hundred percent not true. As you know, Ben, we're we're big fans of Roth conversions in our office and a lot of our clients have been in Roth conversion planning for years. But I still have a, a decent size, a decent subset of my clients who have never done a Roth conversion. Uh, and I believe they could benefit with moving dollars from the tax deferred accounts over to the tax free account. Um, but for some reason they don't do it. I, I think there's probably some confusion and misunderstanding about the, the process because I mean, we've been told our whole lives to put our money in our 401k, tax defer, tax defer, and we'll be in a lower bracket when, when we retire. But and that's not always the case. I'll tell you, probably 70% of our clients, maybe 70, 75% of our clients wind up 
in the same or a higher tax bracket at some point in retirement. And people are shocked to hear that. And, and if, if you listen to the podcast that I had with, with David Brooks a, a few weeks ago, that is for one reason. It's, it's well, it really can be for a couple of reasons. First of all, the tax brackets can and, and will change. That's going to happen. So even if your income's the same, you could wind up being in a, in a higher bracket because the IRS changes the numbers. So if you hadn't listened to that podcast with, with me interviewing David Brooks, go back and listen to that because we go through some of the numbers. But that part's completely out of control. The second reason is that a lot of people that people I think are going to be in the same or higher bracket is because of what, what I call forced income. And this is the RMD, again, that we're required to take. Now, that RMD stands for Required Minimum Distribution. And, and our software will tell us exactly how much money you're going to be forced to take in the future from these accounts. And, and this, is, this can push you really into a, a much higher tax bracket and many times trigger taxes that, that you weren't even aware of. So this is why we want to be tactical about our strategy. Start moving money from your tax deferred accounts to a tax free account if it makes sense. So that way, if, if, when Congress changes the rules, it, it won't affect you. And that's having a tax efficient plan. Very good. Well, some great, how do you know questions, some important ones that you're probably thinking about, wondering about if you're planning for retirement. And if you don't know how to answer these questions quite yet, or aren't quite sure if you're in the right position, again, please reach out. JL Perkins Wealth Management is happy to sit down with you, start looking at your overall financial picture, determining what your needs might be, how much you need to have saved, how much income you might need for your lifestyle and retirement, whatever those questions might be for you specifically. Lee's happy to help you with that. Again, you can schedule a meeting at talkwithjlp.com. Again, talkwithjlp.com. Lee, any final thoughts before we get out of here? No, this has been good. So if if you've got other questions or, you know, some of the questions that we talked about to know, some of the today on this show, how, you know, how do you know or what do I do? Any of those things, I would be happy to to answer some of those questions. And sometimes people don't want to come in the office. That's fine. If we, if we, we can easily start you off with that 15 minute phone call and you can call the office and schedule that of course you can find all of our information online or you can go to, you know book the 15 minute call online at like ben said www.talkwithjlp.com and you can it'll pull up my calendar and we can set up a 15 minute call i'd yep. lo- love to chat with you and answer your questions all right very good well thanks for listening to another episode of my retirement clarity some more good ones to come so please hit subscribe wherever you listen We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate it, man. Hey there, Lee Perkins here. If you're like a lot of folks, you've been listening to this podcast for a long time now. But I've got an important question for you. Have you implemented any of the ideas that we've discussed on the show? If you haven't, what are you waiting on? You know you're not getting any younger. So here's my challenge. Don't just consume the content. Our number one goal for this podcast is to help you close the gap between what you know and what you implement. So if you're ready to implement, take that first step today and visit www.talkwithjlp.com and schedule a 15-minute phone call with one of our advisors and we'll help you close the gap between what you know and what you implement so you can enjoy the next phase of your life. Now is your time. Don't procrastinate any longer. Investment advisory services are offered by J.L. Perkins Wealth Management, a registered investment advisor and insurance agency. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Always consult with a qualified tax, legal, or investment professional before taking any action.